You stand on steps leading up to the massive concrete structure that is the library. High above the building is the glowing orb that is the full moon. In the distance, a church bell finishes its twelfth toll. The library's door opens all on its own. You find yourself walking into the darkened building. It's not long before you are walking down the lobby, noticing how the bookshelves resemble tombstones in some internal graveyard. You think the noises you are hearing is your footsteps echoing off the high walls and ceiling, but there is another sound. Whispers. From amongst the shelves, there are whispers all around you. It is not long until you are seated in a reading area. That is when the specter comes forth, holding a book in its hands. The figure approaches. Upon reaching you, it opens the book. This is another midnight in the Full Moon Library. The Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as I best could, but when he ventured upon insult I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged, this was a point definitively settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when the retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my good will. I continued as my wont to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmary, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How? said he. Amontillado? A pipe? Impossible. And in the middle of carnival? 
I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado. I have my doubts. Amontillado. And I must satisfy them. Amontillado. Well, as you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchese cannot sell Amontillado from Sherry. Well, and yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchese, I have... <coughs> <coughs> I have... <coughs> I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado, you have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a requilera closely about my person. I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance one and all as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. It is further on, said I, but observe the white web work which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned toward me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. <coughs> <coughs> Nitre? he asked at length. Nitre, I replied. Uh, how long have you had that cough? <coughs> <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is, <clears throat> it is nothing, he said at last. Come, I said with decision, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough, he said. The cough is a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draught of this medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked off the neck of a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mold. Drink, I said, presenting him the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly, and with his bells jingled, I drink, he said, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, he said, are extensive. 
the Montressors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge foot door in a field azure, the foot crushes a serpent, rampant, whose veins are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune lacessit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the Madoc, and we had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the most recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The niger, I said. See, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back. Ere it is too late, your cough. It is nothing, he said. Let us go on, but first, <clears throat> another drought of the Madoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of the de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upward with a gesticulation I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise, and he repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I replied. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Oh, yes. Yes, I said. Yes. Yes. You? Impossible, a mason? A mason, I replied. A sign, he said. It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my requilaire. You jest? he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Montiato. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again, arrived at a deep crypt, in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead, in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth, the bones had been removed and thrown down, and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess. In depth of about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs and backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the Amontillado, and as for Lucchese, he is an ignoramus interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his wrist, waist, it was about 
the work of a few seconds to secure it, he was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the night here. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you, but must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejected my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I replied, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone mortar. With these materials, and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and the third and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was now nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused and holding the flambeau over the mason work threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chain formed seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated. I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess, but the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I re-approached the wall. I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed. I aided. I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. We will have a, we'll have a many rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado, but it, it is, is it not getting late? Will not they be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone? Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montressor! Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato. No answer. I called again, Fortunato. 
no answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth a feeble reply, only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick, on the account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. And for the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requisite. Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard by Thomas Gray The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd wind slowly o'er the lee. The plowman homeward plods his weary way, and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, and Drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Save that from yonder ivy mantled tower, the moping owl does to the moon complain, of such as wandering near her secret bower molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath those rugged elms that you trees shade, where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap, each in his narrow cell forever laid the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. The breezy call of incense breathing morn, the swallow twittering from the straw belt shed, the cock shrill clarion or the echoing horn, no more shall ruse them from their lowly bed. For them no more the blazing hearth shall burn, or busy housewife ply her evening care. No children run to lisp their sire's return, or climb his knees the envy kiss to share. Oft did the harvest to their sickle yield, their furrow off the stubborn glebe has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield, how bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, nor grandeur hear with a disdainful smile the short and simple annals of the poor. The boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, and all that beauty and all that wealth ever gave awaits alike the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Nor you, ye proud, impute to these the fault, if memory over their tomb no trophies raise, where through the long-drawn aisle and fretted fault the pealing anthem swells the note of praise. Can storied yearn or animated bust back to its mansion call the fleeting breath? Can honor's voice provoke the silent dust, or flattery soothe the dull, cold ear of death? Perhaps in this neglected spot is laid some heart once pregnant with celestial fire, hands that the rod of empire might have swayed or waked to ecstasy the living lyre. But knowledge to their eyes, her ample page, rich with spoils of time, did never unroll. Chill penury repressed their noble rage and froze the genial current of the soul. Full many a gem of purest ray serene, the dark unfathomed caves of ocean bear. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen and waste its sweetness 
on the desert air. Some village Hamden, that with dauntless breast, the little tyrant of his fields, withstood. Some mute and glorious Milton here may rest, some Cromwell, guiltless of his country's blood. The applause of listening senates to command, the threats of pain and ruin to despise, to scatter plenty over a smiling field and read their history in a nation's eyes. Their lot forbade nor circumscribed alone, their glowing virtues but their crimes confined, forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind. The struggling pains of conscious truth to hide, to quench the blushes of ingenuous shame, or heap the shrine of luxury and pride, with incense kindled at the muse's flame. Far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, their sober wishes never learned to stray. Along the cool sequestered veil of life, they kept the noiseless tenor of their way. Yet even these bones from insult to protect some frail memorial, still erected nigh, with uncouth rhymes and shapeless sculpture decked, implores the passing tribute of a sigh. Their names, their years, spelt by the unlettered muse, the place of fame and elegy supply, and many a holy text around she strews, that teach the rustic moralist to die. For who, to dumb forgetfulness a prey, this pleasing anxious being ever resigned, left the warm precincts of the cheerful day, nor cast one longing, lingering look behind? On some fond breast the parting soul relies, some pious drops the closing eye requires. Even from the tomb the voice of nature cries, even in our ashes live their wanted fires. For thee who, mindful of the unhonored dead, dost in these lines their artless tale relate, if some chance by lonely contemplation led, some kindred spirit shall inquire thy fate. Haply some Hoary-headed swain may say, Oft have we seen him at the peep of dawn, Brushing with hasty steps the dews away, To meet the sun upon the upland long. There at the foot of yonder nodding beech, That wreathes its old fantastic roots so high, His listless length at noontime would he stretch And pour upon the brook that babbles by. Hard by young wood, now smiling as in scorn, muttering his wayward fancies he would rove, now drooping woeful wan like one forlorn, or crazed with care, or crossed in hopeless love. One morn I missed him on the custom hill, along the heath and near his favorite tree. Another came, nor yet beside the rill, nor up the lawn, nor at the woods was he. The next with dirges due in sad array, slow through the churchway path we saw him born. Approach and read, for thou canst read, the lay, graved on the stone beneath yon aged thorn. The Epitaph Here rest his head upon the lap of earth, a youth to fortune and to fame unknown. Fair science frowned not on his humble birth, and melancholy marked him for her own. Large was his bounty, and his soul sincere. Heaven did a recompense as largely send. He gave to misery all he had, a tear. He gained from heaven, t'was all he wished, a friend. No farther seek his merits to disclose or draw his frailties from their dread abode. There they alike in trembling hope repose, the bosom of his father and his God.
thank you very much for tuning in to the first episode of Midnight at the Full Moon Library. Our story today was Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. Our poem was Elegy Written of a Country Churchyard by Thomas Gray. And our song was Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. I'm your humble narrator, Jared Hamline, and with help with mastering was the incomparable Justin Hamline. Thank you very much for tuning in and join us next time. Until then, support your local library. Thank you very much.